Welcome listeners to the latest instalment of the Invisible Cabaret podcast. Today, Ferrera Rochelle, that is myself, and the lovely Rosie Verbose. Oh no, Rosie Verbose. You remixed it. (laughs) (laughs) Rosie Verbose. Hello. Um, Do you want to say hello? Hello. Oh, great. (laughs) Today, (laughs) this is how it always goes. We're so smooth. Um, Today, we're joined by the wonderfully talented Mouncelot. Woohoo! 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 Also known as Kate. So we'll probably be dropping in and out of calling you Mouncelot and Kate, if you're okay with that. Fine. Great. Good. Good. (laughs) Feeling a bit run down into none of us. None Not at all. We're all <laughs> fighting on cinders. Uh Fighting? No, that's firing. Rochelle, stop talking. Uh, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> welcome, Mancelot. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you. I feel very honoured to be on the podcast. It's oh, our fun. pleasure. The honour is ours. <laughs> It really, really is. Bosh right in because some people are going, that's a strange name. Where did that come from? Yeah, um, I think it was a friend at uni who gave me the name Mancelot. And I don't think I made the connection to like burlesque type stuff in, until joining the cabaret. And then I was like, oh, well, actually, that's quite a a good title for a cabaret performer man slot like slightly on the blue side maybe Mm -hmm. full disclosure I actually didn't clock the verb mounts in it for a long time because I was just thinking of the fact that it's your surname that is the genius oh my gosh I didn't (laughs) think (laughs) Rochelle that connection (gasps) that's genius oh Rochelle how have I missed that Mounts, as in to mount. Oh my yeah. god! To be fair, actually, the the thing that really made the connection for me was when my sister in law was getting married to my brother, and she's an academic, so she was keeping her surname or joining the two together for the purposes of her papers and so on. And she was like, mm, "I have to be really careful about which way I put the names." <laughs> To be fair, I only clocked it because of writing it in um, Instagram captions and realising that in previous captions, Kate, you had spelled it different ways. And it was only seeing it with the TS that I was like, OK, I get it now. Because <laughs> I've always... I spelled it C-E. I thought I spelled it like my name just with a lot at the end. But have you I put have it with done, a TS? It's varied. The, the scrolls vary. Scholars scholars differ on the subject. <laughs> Definitely seen different artefacts. Because so. I've always just imagined that for some reason that you had a, a kind of connection to Camelot. Yeah, Lancelot. Well, I, yeah. Think, yeah. That, I think that's the original thing. I think that was the thing that my friends was thinking when they gave me that surname, was it was something more along the lines of Camelot. A double entendre. Mark. Well, there you go. You learn something new every day. <laughs> I love that you hadn't seen that before. <laughs> it's a shame oh that we're not still doing the YouTube versions of this because your face was was quite a picture there. Ross. Realization really... dawned. A penny <laughs> dropped. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I like yeah. it too because it's quite. Um, I well, to my ear, it's quite androgynous because I think of Lancelot as being a knight, and then. It's you've not got a sir or a lady or anything. It's just mounts a lot. It's kind of like a nice standalone. You are your own entity. Thank you very much. That's nice. I think that having older brothers and I think like really resisting femininity from a certain age Mm. in some ways and always like sort of wanting to be a tomboy when I was younger, but just having like, like having none of the fearlessness of tomboys. Right. (laughs) <laughs> so it was like the worst tomboy. I just had the hair. <laughs> That's it. Um, I think that thing of being able to be a bit less identifiable as a woman or slightly more masculine, there's always been a certain draw towards that in some ways, even though I'm like, as a person, I think not very traditionally masculine at all. I'd say mm, no I would I'd agree with that that's really interesting so you never you never kind of flirted with the idea of going with like I don't know sugar pie sweetie bum or you know something very 
you know, <laughs> feminine, burlesque y, cheesecake y. No, no. And I think it does, it does sit in that sort of place for me of, I think, being able to say there's something cool about not being too girly Mm -hmm. or like resisting girliness in some way like I remember from quite a young age I really rejected the color pink I was like I hate pink I don't want it anywhere near me now I love pink I can't can't get enough of it in my life but (laughs) um, (laughs) does that sound weird um again only if we try (laughs) that's the (laughs) That's the curse of cabaret, isn't it? Everything suddenly becomes a, an innuendo. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah right, uh-huh. right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, also quite, I also quite like the the, the name Mounts a lot because it sounds fun. And, you know, the rhyming of bounce, it just makes me think bouncy and kind of rough and tumbly, which is really your brand, you know, of, of clowning. You know, it's I, I when I picture Mounts a lot, I picture silliness and fun and rolling around and and yeah. going a little bit outside the box in your performance style so I think it really cool. captures you and your art oh thanks mate <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> um so thinking of clowning how mm. did you get into clowning because for those of you who have not seen any of our shows uh Mount Slot is our resident clown it sounds offensive it's not <laughs> <laughs> that's like the resident clown <laughs> but you also have your own company um where you you partake in some clowning as well um so yeah do you want to explain a little bit more about that and yeah I got into clowning through my theatre school I studied at um quite a well-known physical theatre school called Lecoq in Paris and yeah. and then there was a London version set up, so I went to the London uh, oh. Lecoq School, yeah. and um, one of the modules in that we studied like various modules, like grotesque, commedia dell'arte, and then towards the end we looked at clowning, and it was like a three-week module that we did. It was like the best time of my life, I think, really. Um, and then to have hit upon clowning, and it was like another world opened up, really, like. A sort of experience of joyfulness and humour and just, I mean, there's something about seeing people in their sort of truest self and making themselves open to being laughed at, which is just like, it's mind blowing. There's something so magical about it. I just, yeah, it just really like, it was, it was the one for me. I think I fell in love at that moment. I, and I think, like, they kind of explain to us that, you know, clown kind of underpins all performance because it's it's really about connection with your audience and it's about being very open. Mm. But the other stuff that we did was very, like, it was all, like, outside-of-the-box kind of performance. Like, we spent a couple of weeks embodying paintings or, like, being an egg frying in a pan. You know, when people, like, talk about, like... <laughs> which tree were you at drama school? And it was like, it's kind of, it's like, it's almost along the lines of that stereotype, but it was all about like getting you to think about movement and this idea of like motion is emotion. So if you can physically move a space and the dynamics of a space, you will create movement in your audience. Yeah. And then the movement of humour, which is, for me, is like I think fundamental, and when we talk about mental health as well, like how humor can be such a um, such a tool for healing, really, oh, and being wow. able to shift and shake some of the kind of not to use a religious word here. I know you'll appreciate this, Rosie. <laughs> uh, shake some of the strongholds that I think you know that you can experience when you're having difficult mental health, and these kind of like these blocks that are like feel immovable and I think there's something about humour that can start to start to shake that up Mm. that is actual sorcery isn't it you know that's total magic and I think we're we're going to touch on this later on when we we go into your the piece that you the the biggest piece that you do uh with us um but it's really been incredibly healing for you hasn't it this mental health with you know using her humour to unpick mental health experiences 
yeah that is now a good a good point to talk about it because so there's sure. a, there's a few things that we've trialed haven't there haven't there been Kate but um the sort of big consistent one that's been a, a big uh project really hasn't it was the there's a lecture that that you do do you want to tell us for anyone who hasn't seen it um tell us about the the lecture and the process of of making that yeah um yeah I'd love to uh so the piece is it's a solo lecture of this kind of like uptight woman who is um informing people about complex post-traumatic stress disorder and borderline personality disorder and kind of looking at what what are the key elements of that and how it differs to post-traumatic stress disorder but during the course of the the lecture her body starts to rebel against her and ends up sort of taking over the body kind of ends up taking over obviously the significance of the body taking over is um because that is a, a strong element of cptsd is that correct yeah it was probably one of the defining factors of my experience of trauma was my body um almost like screaming at me that something was wrong mm. like my mind was completely oblivious or like my my frontal part of my mind was oblivious but my back part of my mind was um in a lot of distress and so it was like my body was talking to me um in very strange and at the time unreadable ways so one of the one of the big things I had was um involuntary spasms and I went through a period of like chucking things often I'd like have a glass of water in my hand and I would chuck the water over myself Right. <laughs> so it was like my buddy was like wake up wake up right look what's going on wow. um or I'd like drop something and it would make such a noise and it was like this almost like temporary loss of control that was and and like lots of trauma experts will talk about this is um that the body needs to release the chemicals that get stored during traumatic events and so what happens to particularly to animals in the wild is they will shake after a traumatic event. And there's something around that, I think, in um what can happen to a person when they when they are they have a you know deeply re- repressed um experience of something traumatic. Mm. Um, so yeah, so the the piece was very much an attempt to kind of externalize that experience. And I think really like it took me roughly about 10 years to make that piece like, on and off mm. and it kind of had different manifestations at different points in time and it wasn't really until getting involved in the cabaret and kind of working on it with you guys that it became what it is now which I think is kind of like a um like it's it's become conscious in a way like before mm. it was like an unconscious idea that was trying to find its way out and um, with your help, with your very brilliant eyes on it, mm-hmm. it's become a, its own entity, I think. And it, it's just so incredible because to hear you talking about it and to imagine that it must have been very scary and like you had no control over your over your body, over your mind. You know, it must have been really very frightening. And to use comedy and clowning to process what must have been a very difficult time is incredible and also I mean to, to hear you explain it, it it sounds very complicated it sounds uh complex and and very deep rooted to watch the piece it's hilarious it's a <laughs> brilliant brilliant piece that is informative whilst also being just so much fun it was such a joy to and it, I mean even now every time we we go back to it there's always new ways of playing with it or new things you want to highlight or something new you've learned that you want to um get in there somehow yeah um it's 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 always somebody's favorite as well like there's always always, like sometimes people be like I don't know whether I can laugh at this or you know it does divide an audience a little bit which is um some people don't like it I personally quite like to divide an audience I think it's good fun um (laughs) or a similar way Kate but yeah there's always people who like really get it 
even if they don't have BPD or anything of the sort, there's something in there in the human condition there that they recognize. They don't have mm-hmm. to have had the same experience. They get it, um, mm-hmm. which is incredibly powerful. Speaking of um, dividing a room, though, I know that there are elements of the lecture piece, as with any humorous work I guess where um, some people may misinterpret it to be laughing at the condition rather than laughing with which I know is something that we talked about loads in the rehearsal process about how we could best signal that you know this is this is um, a, a piece of empathy not not a judgment but um I wonder if you could speak to that, Kate, and how you walk that line, because that's obviously a big part of a comedian's job. um, And yet it's not an easy thing to do. Most of the comedy that I do, I think there's there's always this dual line of like. I do something for humour, but then alongside that, there's there's always vulnerability. And I think this comes across in, in the lecture. There's a sense of. Um, you have moments of seeing the character trapped yes or in panic or in like very yeah very very vulnerable moments with her which I think uh, are the moments where the audience can know this is a real person and this experience is complex (laughs) the complex experience and I think for me actually when I think about the piece I'm like I'd, I'd be um surprised I think if, if if anybody came away from it being like oh she's just mocking someone who has borderline personality disorder but yeah I think I, I, for me personally as well it's a lot about your intention when you're making stuff mm-hmm. um and I think I think it's very hard if your intention is to um produce something that is like not mocking to then end up making something that is mocking. I think that's that's quite difficult in some ways. I think you will always get people whose own narrative is so close to the surface that they will read it in a particular way. Yes. Yeah, so with my other theatre company, we made, um, we made a clown show about um, growing up in the church and how they talk about sexuality. And there's a moment where um, we interact with this old box that has this image of a goddess on there and it kind of really influences my character and I kind of come under its spell and one of the people who watched it once was like yeah I really didn't like the moment where you were um, possessed by the devil I thought that was like you know that was really not well handled and we were like sorry what (laughs) I don't remember that happening (laughs) I don't remember writing anything about becoming possessed by the devil but so you will obviously you'll always get people who who will yeah. inevitably like we all do it like we all subjectively receive stuff so of course and then I think that's just a process of kind of figuring out whether that is the majority of people or whether that's quite particular mm. I think yeah. also when it comes to a, a lot of our work that we do we we spend a lot of time working through pieces to to view it from as many uh stances as possible um I think with the lecture piece it is about the piece as a whole the character goes on a journey so if you take one section of it it could be read as something but then if you take a different section it could be read as something completely different but if you look at the whole story arc of the character um you get you get everything together is not something to be mocked um and it 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 does you're right it the character shows a lot of vulnerability at at different points throughout it i think the most recent iteration of it um where actually the the body suit that doesn't really look like a body but as as you've quite rightly said is a is a, a trauma body it's how your character views their body it's not something to be mocked but it's then removed of this I don't want to give anything away, but it's 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 semi removed um, to kind of show what's going on inside and underneath, and and, and you know it becomes a powerful mm-hmm. statement. But it's difficult; it's so difficult, and that's a lot of what a lot of what we spend our time doing is working on pieces and and seeing how that line between being laughed at 
and laughing with um also a great question I don't think I have any answers to this but like how do you make work that is funny and truthful around something that is really complex absolutely how do you do that yeah Um, yeah at a time I guess but yeah that's not not easy but I do think that is one of the benefits of clowning is that clowning uh has been a form of art since eons ago you know it's it's it is very universal as a as an art form so I think possibly the lecture wouldn't work if it was a different art form that you were using so I, I think it can appeal to lots of people on lots of different levels can you tell we like you we're pleased <laughs> <laughs> also, at the risk of being very highbrow I would remind our learned viewers and listeners that the root word of burlesque is uh, actually means to to mimic or to make fun of to um yeah, to parody yeah to parody oh. so even though some will be like well there's no real kind of like striptease element is that really burlesque um I think you'll find <laughs> <laughs> according to the original the original text it's uh a-okay no. <laughs> <laughs> also no. I don't want to um expose too much Kate so just tell me if I'm if I am speaking too much but I think it would be uh interesting for people to know that there were certain rehearsal days where we had slated to do the lecture and you knew it was too raw um some days where you actually just didn't want to engage with the stuff that you needed to make that piece work Mm -hmm. um I wonder if you have any uh tips for anybody making work that is very personal to them about how they know when they're ready to do that oh good question good question thanks (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if you will ever know if you're ready or not without putting your foot in you know putting your toe in as it were I think it is sort of as you've kind of intimated it's about you know each day will be different and just being receptive to where your body and your mind is on particular days and kind of respecting that and saying like I mean it's difficult when you've got a deadline obviously but like if you've got the luxury of some time with it I think doing it with other people is really important having some support when you're making something that's that personal and also yeah just being in response to where you are and not pushing it if you need to not push it. Mm. That's really good advice. I think the piece has a lot of truth in it truth to yourself and also it's a lot of it is medically correct you know my my dad's a therapist and he loves that piece because he thinks it really is very clear and uh entertainment baby yes absolutely (laughs) entertainment Uh (laughs) um yeah it it, he's he thinks that it it handles something that is very raw and sensitive and difficult to communicate in a really sensitive intelligent um, and concise way. Um, and I think, you know, you can't get any higher praise than that, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, I'll take it. You know, Brian's, I'll take Brian's it. Top, top tier, top tier praise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Forgive me for cutting in, but I just want to make sure that I've asked because I think we're, we're slowing down to, a, to, a, to an end for this one. But there's so much more that we could talk to you about, Kate. We hope you'll come back to talk way more I'd love that yeah wanted to ask if it was okay because I'm trying to put myself in the headspace of someone with BPD who's listening or uh, with CBTSD you're talking about you know your uh, involuntary spasms and things in the in the past tense so can I ask um without going you know too deep or invasive um what your mental health journey has been like to get to where you are now what's been most helpful (laughs) just in like 30 (laughs) seconds or less you know describe your mental health in three words (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) yeah I mean it's been a very long journey for me there was a period of crisis which I think lasted about two to three years and when I say crisis I mean like I didn't feel safe at all right in that period of time 
and I wasn't in a particularly stable life situation. I didn't have a huge amount of support around me. And then from then, it's got like gradually better as the time has gone on. And I've had various different types of therapy about to go back into therapy through the NHS. Congrats, so that's great. Very lucky on that front. Um, lockdown has been a wild ride, yeah. mental health wise. Yeah. yeah, which has been quite interesting, really. Like because I think I felt like I really revisited some stuff from when I was in the crisis period. Oh, um, but also, I'm in a different place to them. I think, yeah, I think it's so different for everyone what what it actually looks like, and. Um, Mine has just, yeah, taken a huge amount of time. And I think actually making the peace and going on that journey with you guys and, like, finding a way to express um, something of my truth, my experience, has been hugely valuable in that. And I think now, from when we were first starting to do it and how uncomfortable and how much shame I used to have after I'd performed it. Right, yeah. Yeah. Partly because it wasn't quite together and just being a bit like artistically shamed. <laughs> but then also because my condition is kind of linked to family stuff and my family don't know that I have had these diagnoses. Um, they don't know a huge amount about my experience. And so every time I come to say it publicly, there's always kind of like an internal backlash. Yeah, sure. Um, and then be, doing it now, like three or however many years on we are um and feeling like just really proud of what we've done and really thrilled that it's that it has a life and that the piece works now you know the jokes land and it has the message is what we want to say with it now and thinking like yeah it does feel a it feels like something we've made together and b it feels just amazing really it feels like wow this is this is something that has come out of the depths of agony in some ways and yet is a real gem and a real light, I think. And I don't say that necessarily to blow my own trumpet at all, but just like that is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. And I'm really grateful for that. Oh, my God. <laughs> lovely thing. And if you won't blow your own trumpet, we will, because I do think you delving into this and being vulnerable enough to make art about it is um oh rosh bless her just uh wiping away crying. A, a, a mini baby tear moment yeah but i do think it is one of the like the ultimate power moves you are such a badass and so brave in your artistry you're just a very inspiring person and i'm so thrilled that you're part of the cabaret oh absolutely nice. it's on record now <laughs> <laughs> it also just shows the power of creativity doesn't it Absolutely. like the, just the, the power that you know finding a craft that you can communicate through we don't need to get very political here but it is just heartbreaking that the arts are not being protected right now because they are just so valuable for so many people in so many ways and obviously we don't know what the future looks like right now for for the arts industry but anybody involved in the arts who is listening to this we see you we feel you it's I mean it's a life much further we know that we know that we need it yeah Yeah. absolutely yeah Absolutely. Um, I think most people recognise the benefit and the value of art. Yes. Even if the people in power are not protecting it. Yes. The general public would say, you know, this has a really beneficial and worthwhile existence. Yeah. And maybe it's on us as artists to try and mobilise in some way people to protect it and to demand that because you can see examples of governments having to listen to the people when they stand up on mass absolutely yeah that's true yeah oh oh it got oh. their up in here <laughs> <laughs> the women barricade um speaking of musicals this is a weird segue but i'm doing it we always finish up with saying something that we're grateful for and uh, for me this week, I'm grateful that the Hamilton film 
is now available. I watched it full volume with subtitles because I watched it with my mother, who the rap was far too fast. She wouldn't have been able to catch a single bloody word. Um, and we watched with subtitles. And man, it was great. I picked up on was stuff it? I have never heard before. The production is amazing. Mum has yeah. never listened to rap in her life, but she was bobbing her little head along. And um, afterwards she said, I just, I'm so glad I've seen that. Thank you for sharing it with me. And it oh. was a beautiful moment. So that's my gratitude this week. Protect the arts people, otherwise <laughs> we won't have Hamilton. <laughs> and God bless Lynn manuel Oh, oh. God bless Well, What a genius. What a man. So smart. He also is responsible for Moana. And he's so philanthropic as well. The stuff he did for um, to aid Puerto Rico. It's just, oh, oh could talk about more. Yeah. Yum, 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 yum. Yum, 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 yum. yum. Oh, oh. <laughs> Bounce a lot. What are you grateful for? I wanted to say I'm grateful for the cabaret and I'm grateful for the sisterhood because it really is a sisterhood and it really um, is a group of girls who will, if you sneeze, they will appear and surround you with love. <laughs> 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 I don't think I've really ever experienced that like real bond, I guess, based on the understanding that, you know, we all, we're all struggling at at a certain level and yeah people are just very generous with their time and their and their love oh sure. that's lovely and we didn't tell you to say that did we, we didn't well <laughs> if you could just write out a little check uh -huh. i see how it is okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> amazing it's it's amazing Frere rochelle I'm grateful that I'm at a point in my life where I am able to take care of myself in a way that I previously have not. I don't really know. I, I'm not sleeping great and I'm not I'm not really feeling very good as such, but I'm I'm still taking care of myself. I've started up a new skincare regime. I recently had some great baths. I've been taking time for my friends and I've been learning how to listen actively and how to be a support to people as much as possible. And, you know, I I feel like I've grown a lot over the past few years. So maybe I'm grateful for me oh. being at where I'm at. Oh, man, <laughs> yes. Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting to say that. Single or a little. Da, 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 da. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've won the top prize. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> that's so fantastic and important as well to take a moment and go, do you know what? I work really hard and I'm yeah. not where I want to be, but I'm sure as hell not where I was. There are definitely <laughs> days where, where I'm not firing on all cylinders which I think I said earlier incorrectly um, but you know I'm I'm trying and I'm just gonna keep trying oh Absolutely. what a fantastic place to leave it yay um, lovely, <laughs> lovely uh listeners please do if you are enjoying the podcast please do lend us a hand and give us a quick rating on whatever you are listening to us on that helps other people find the podcast also if you want to join in and tell us what you're grateful for um we're on instagram and facebook and twitter maybe twitter is the best place for it so if you hashtag right. invisible podcast it'd be nice if we could start sharing what our listeners are grateful for as well hello listeners it's ferrera rochelle here during post-production, Rosie Verbose and I realised we forgot to ask Mountslot if she had anything she'd like to promote. Don't worry, floggings will be administered. Naughty. So, Mountslot, would you like to take it away? Thanks, Ferrera Rochelle. Yeah, just to say that um, my theatre company, Beside Ourselves, have moved on to TikTok. We are in the 21st century. Uh, we are making some pretty great videos on there. So if you're on TikTok, give us a follow. We're at Beside Ourselves. Thank you, Kate, so much for joining us. Mounts a lot. Thank you so much for having me. It was delightful. Great. And uh, we'll see all of you in the next one. Bye. See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>